Welcome to our Sensations English monthly webinar for teachers, the first of our 2022 monthly webinar for teachers series. I'm Adam, the ELT specialist at Sensations English, and today we are delighted to welcome our very own Fran Watkins, who will be speaking on the art and scope of retelling in ELT, an invaluable task type. Just a reminder that if you are watching this webinar live, a CPD certificate will be sent to your email 24 hours after the webinar has finished. If you're watching the recording, please make your own note of your professional development activity. The webinar will last an hour and will include time for questions at the end of Fran's talk. Please write your questions in the Q&A box. The Q&A button appears when you move your mouse to the bottom of the Zoom window. If someone's already written the same question, you can click the thumbs up button next to that question to move it higher up the list rather than writing it again. And if you need any help during the webinar, please contact me in the chat box. Sensations English is focused on helping teachers develop their skills. We're delighted to be hosting regular webinars for teachers to support quality evidence-based practice. You can view all our previous webinars Sorry, wrong slide. You can view all our previous webinars, um, uh, and including the monthly webinars and our special series on using video in ELT. And all of these become, come with the slides from the session as well. We hope that they will help you to develop your own practice and expand your use of authentic resources in your classes. Sensations English lesson resources are a great new advance in ELT content. We're delighted to offer teachers hundreds of video and news article resources, all graded at five CFR levels and all with ready-made learning activities. They make video and news accessible to le all learners and hassle-free for teachers. There are three new five-level resources to use every week, giving you access to the most up-to-date content to use with all your learners. Our Sensations English Teachers Edition includes logins for all students and a digital teacher gradebook, which lets you organize your students into classes, set tasks and monitor them live and review your learners' progress over time. To start using this great resource in the, in the Teachers Edition, just go to the link on the screen and in the chat box now. Now, to tell you a little bit about our today's speaker, Fran is a highly experienced ELT author, test writer, teacher and teacher trainer. She holds a PGCE and an MSc TEFL and has worked in Europe, the Middle East and Southeast Asia, both for the British Council and International House, as well as providing in-house teacher training and tutoring on CELTA and DELTA courses. Prior to COVID, Fran taught at Reading University, developing language and methodology skills of Chinese primary and secondary school teachers of English. I'm also delighted to say that Fran is one of our Sensations English writers and regularly works on our video and article news reports and learning activities. Fran, thanks once again for being here. It's okay. over to you. Right, hello everybody. <laughs> it's nice to see everybody. Um, and I can see from the chat that people are calling in from all corners of the world, which is fantastic. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. I hope you can all see that. Okay, the art and scope of retelling in ELT. Um, so this is close to my heart because I've been doing retelling for many, many years now. So it's a joy to be able to spread the word. Um, I hope you get something out of this session. Let's start. Okay, so today we're going to look at these things, hopefully, obviously rather fleetingly, um, but the power of storytelling and its effect on the brain, a bit on neuroscience and touching on narrative theory. And then we're going to zoom in on retelling and its background in TBLT, so task-based language teaching. And then we're going to look at um, its scope and value in the language classroom. And we're also going to look at how to modify the retelling task for variety and differentiation. So I hope some of those sound appealing. Um, okay. 
So to start with, um, just to tell you something you probably already know, but I want you to kind of think about it in a, in a bigger way today. And that is that stories are ubiquitous, they're everywhere, they are profound, and they have impact. And we're going to look at this session at not just stories, not stories that, that we might um, normally think of when we hear that word stories, and we're not just talking about fairy tales or novels even, we're talking about small stories, articles, news items, gossip, whatever. Um, because stories are so powerful, that's why news sells, that's why gossip's go gossip, and that's why conspiracy theories mushroom. So not all stories and our love of stories is necessarily a good thing. I've put this picture of Postman Pat here. I don't know if you're familiar with Postman Pat, um, but I've put that there because I realized uh, many, many years ago when my daughter was very young, she was a toddler, that I was in fact a story addict. Um, I used to I used to sometimes join her when she was about two, when she was eating her breakfast, she used to ask for Postman Pat. And I realized that I couldn't tear myself away from the screen until I knew what the ending of the story was. So I realized even, even then that I needed to know what the be not just the beginning and the middle, but also the ending of the story. I don't know if you ever found yourself in that same situation. But I think that's proof on a very basic and slightly humorous level that stories work and that they appeal to us. JK Rowling as you all know, is the Harry Potter author. A little bit um, in some people's bad books at the moment, a slightly controversial figure. But she says this about human beings and stories. Unlike any other creature on this planet, human beings can learn and understand without having experienced. They can think themselves into other people's places. What she's touching on here is something we're gonna look a bit more closely now, and that's about empathy, about our ability as humans to imagine and empathize with others. We are social animals and we feel empathy, and this is what makes us distinct. Stories chime with our effective and emotional selves. They strike a chord with us. An emotional and empathetic reaction means that something is likely to be remembered or encoded. Okay, and I'm gonna tell you a little story to show, show, show you this. My husband, last week or so, he was, he was telling me, he's a football fan, by the way, he was telling me about a, an amusing clip that he'd found um, concerning Norwich City. Now, Norwich City is a football team here in England and lately they've been doing pretty badly. Um, and this clip shows Norwich City fans celebrating, but then not celebrating a real goal. They're pretending because they're so sick of not having any goals and they want to enthuse their players at the football stadium. So they, they start chanting, let's pretend we scored a goal. But when I first saw that, having had that little introduction from my from my husband, um, I felt this warm glow around me. Um, I just loved seeing the fans celebrating, celebrating for their team. But of course, they were just pretending. So it was this mass pretense. And I enjoyed thinking about, well, how did they get everybody to do it at the same time? How did they chant at the same time? And I made my own little story up around the story. And. Um, I was reading recently a book by a guy called Armstrong, and he talks about um, how we are, we are tuned into stories, we're trying to make sense of them. Um, our brain is toing and froing between images, between things we watch, between things we hear, and it's trying to make sense of what we see. Our brains are hardwired to receive and make stories except that our brains aren't hardwired, but they're constantly rewiring through neurons. They're making pathways to interpret and to make sense of the world through stories. So 
an addendum to that little clip that I just showed you was a day after those Norwich City fans had been pretending to celebrate a goal. Um, I read <laughs> that the manager of Norwich City team had been on Twitter begging his fans to stop chanting, to stop chanting like that because he said it was putting off the players. Okay, so in our brain there, we then, it, there's a twist in the tail. Yeah, and then we have to make new pathways in our brain to adapt to that. Okay, that's what our brain's doing all the time when we hear, hear stories and maybe there's a twist in the tail and something else happens. We're trying to make sense of the world. We're trying to make sense of stories. We're trying to make sense of the world through stories. It's very clever, toing and froing. Okay, and let me tell you something else about the brain, which is also intriguing. This picture here, I happened to see when I was browsing the internet recently, and it took me back to a time several, time, several years ago, which I'd forgotten about. I was on, the, on a beach in Croatia with two very close friends of mine, and this picture just looked the spitting image of that spot, that piece of beach, <laughs> those coffees, that water, etc. And I'll just describe this to you very briefly, because we were sitting in these very colourful deck chairs and our feet were, were on these very hot pebbles. They were all oval shaped, very warm. Um, and we would periodic, periodically just pick up these pebbles and fling them into that blue, blue water and watch them plop into the very clear waters of the Mediterranean. Yeah, every few minutes we'd throw one further and further into the distance. And then after a time, we had about three batches of coffee brought to us because it was the best coffee we'd ever tasted. It was slightly bitter, but on top it was frothy, creamy, and there were bits of cinnamon and crystals of sugar sprinkled on top. And I can still feel that taste in my mouth. Now, if you have empathized with me, sipping that coffee and throwing those stones this shows us another thing another important thing about the brain and that is that you can experience the same emotions the same emotions and also the physical emotions even things like lifting a coffee cup tasting throwing you can experience that even though it's you not doing it you're experiencing it via me okay our brains are amazing Storytelling uses many different parts of the brain, but there are neurochemical reactions on hearing stories. They are triggered all over different parts of the brain, all over. It's nothing simple. It's a very, very complex procedure. But in that procedure, there are um, chemicals. There are things like dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, oxytocin. Um, all these chemicals um, can be awakened, can be triggered by stories. There's a motor and a sensory response, as I've just tried to show you there with my description of our pebbly beach. Um, it's called mirroring, so that you can really fully empathise with a storyteller, something that you hear or see or read. Okay. And nowadays, various fields are recognizing how important and how significant stories are. So these are just a few of the fields that stories are used in. It goes way beyond literature. People can see how effective stories are and how they tune into people's brains and they're using it maybe in marketing or to change people's opinions in law or to show historical events or politically possibly in a bad way as well. We won't look at narrative theory now, um, but I will be able to show you these slides um, in the recording if you want to refer to it. Okay, just to get on to me, I tell stories as a teacher to a whole range of adults. Um, and I've taught lots and lots of different kinds of students, as I'm sure you have, but I've used stories with adults, with also with younger learners, including teenagers, also business students, um, ESP students, so specific um, purposes, for example, medicine, um, 
all different kinds of learners seem to enjoy and engage with stories. This session goes beyond stories per se to focus on retelling. What is retelling? Okay, emphasis on the re there. Okay, it's when we tell someone a story that we have heard, read, or watched and heard, okay? And as social animals, we do this all the time in our first language, okay? So for example, yesterday, I went on a walk with a friend and she was telling me about her short weekend away, okay? That would be telling, okay? But the, she, she then went on to tell me about a problem that a friend of hers was experiencing. So that would be retelling, okay? Now I want you, I don't want you to write it in the chat at this point, I just want you to think. Okay, so please don't write. In everyday conversation, so in your L1, unless you're lucky enough to have, um, to be very fluent in a, in a second language, or you obviously are in, in English, but if, you, if, you, if this happened to you in a, a, a second language such as English or in your first language, when was the last time somebody retold you a story or you retold somebody else's story. So that means you're telling somebody a story that someone has told you. Now this could be a news story. Yeah, it could be a news article, or it could be a story that a friend of yours, for example, or a relative has told you, or even someone like your dentist has told you. Just think for a moment, has somebody retold you a story. We do it surprisingly often. In the language classroom, we're generally talking here for this, for the purposes of this session, we're talking about using L2. So we're talking about using English um, as a way of learning English. Okay, what input can we use? Well, we've got either written or heard or seen and heard. So in other words, this is written, this is texts, this is heard, so maybe it's on the radio or a podcast or somebody telling you, it could be the teacher that's telling them a story or retelling, and it could be seen and heard, so it's obviously a video, okay? Quick task for you, what kind of stories do you use in your ELT classroom already? So we're not talking about retelling, we're just talking about stories. Do you use fairy tales, news items, what? Can you just put in the chat one or two types of stories that you already use? I'd be really interested to know. Great stuff. So imaginary stories, news items, children's literature, picture books, TED Talks, lovely, real life stories and fictional ones. Folk tales. Oh, what a beautiful mix. National Geographic videos. What a lovely, lovely range. Personal experience. That's one of my favorites, actually. Um, yeah, and of course, some Larissa has just said that um, we have fictional and non-fictional te um, texts in our textbooks. Of course, most modern textbooks now integrate lots of lovely skills work, which is authentic or pseudo-authentic. Let's move on. Lovely. Okay, so we're going to hop on to task-based learning now, okay, because this has greatly influenced me in my understanding and usage of retelling. Okay, task-based language teaching. Now, I, I'm not sure how much you already know about task-based learning. I'm sure you know something. Um, just as a quick recap, task-based learning, um, which is, tends to be centered around a task in its pure, pure form, it was getting students in pairs or groups to um, 
to actually perform a task yeah which might be it's not we're not talking about just an activity we're talking about like a big task so for example to um explain the quickest way to get to london yeah by by researching it or something like that or um what else could it be? It, it, it could be, in, in my case, it could be a retelling a story that you've read, but we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, but task-based learning can be used to develop learners speaking. And this is because integrated within TBL is um, a repetition of the task. This often happens in task-based learning and in task-based learning classrooms. And this can be very useful. Narratives are often a typical task-based learning task type. I've put some references here, but there are so many that I couldn't list even a fraction of them. Research often focuses on the effect of planning and task type on production, on spoken language production. So these are the three areas that it tends to focus on. So that would be fluency. So that's doing a meaningful, meaningful speaking in real time. So complexity and range is trying to use more advanced language and accuracy is, often, is um, obviously language that is as error free as possible. So typically these are the areas that task-based learning um, and spoken production focuses on. Okay, now when we're talking about repetition, now this is key here, okay, when we're talking about repetition of a task and retelling, that doesn't mean repetition in our old fashioned sense of the world, word, sorry, in, in the sense of a transmission model or behaviorist sense. Um, retelling is far from that. Basically what you'd expect when students retell a story is that they're going to use some of the same lexis, some of the vocabulary, um, because they're talking about the same ideas, but how they do it in detail is going to be radically different from the first example, okay? Um, whether it's a heard example or a read example. So that's, re that's a really important thing about retelling. It doesn't have to be the same. And this has an impact on the type of task that you would choose, the type of text, sorry, that you would choose, because you, you can't just choose a mini story that students could actually remember by heart. That wouldn't work, okay? Because that's not the aim of retelling. That's not the most remotely task-based learning like. You want short stories. And that's why I do quite often use these news articles, whether they're a video or um, an, a news written news article, because um, they're the nice size. And we're going to get onto some more practical things in a minute, but just before we leave um, some of the background, I'll just mention this word, task iteration. Um, you may have heard of Diane Larson Freeman, um, and recently she has asked <laughs> our world, she's asked us to stop using repetition, but to talk about iteration when it comes to things like task-based learning, because this, this word repetition, she says, is misleading because it's not repetition. Um, every time learners do a task, um, the same response will not be elicited because learners are different and they will use different words. Okay. Now, what's appealing about retelling from a TBL perspective is now, meaning is primary, authentic, and essentially communicative. Narratives, so stories are often in TBL used as a task type. Variables can be easily adjusted around the task and planning. And we're gonna look at that very shortly. You have the possibility in TBL of revisiting the same or similar tasks. So with pure form TBL, the tasks were not revisited, but as time went on, um, people have realized the benefits of redoing the same or a similar task. And it's central acknowledgement of the limits of attentional capacity. Now, let me just explain that briefly. What this means 
is that when you first come to a story and then you tell it to somebody, when you tell it to somebody, you are concentrating on the on the meaning, the content of what you're saying. Now, if I'm a learner of, a, of another language and then I get a chance to retell the story a second time, this time I know the story, it's already in my head, and maybe the second or possibly the third time, I can pay attention to other things. For example, how to use certain words, how to use when we um, concentrate on X area, on a certain area of grammar, yeah? Now this is the core of retelling, okay? It's at the core. Oops, okay. Retelling frees up the brain. Getting learners to retell a story for a second time. So if they, they've told it the first time, um, for meaning, let's say to their partner, they tell it for a second time with a possible conscious focus on form related aspects such as grammar or lexis that lightens the cognitive load. It is like attempting to play a piece on the piano with careful attention to emotion. This is considerably easier if the pianist is already familiar with the melody. And I've got a little task here. Does this metaphor make sense to you? Is it a helpful metaphor? Maybe you can just type that in the chat. What do you think of that metaphor? Is it helpful about retelling? If anyone's got a better metaphor, then they can pop that one in as well. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, most of you so far seem to agree, agree. I play very basic piano, um, and I know that I can't really start to pay attention to the louds and softs and the slowing, etc., until my fingers have almost got that muscle memory that they know the piece by heart. And then, okay, I can start to focus on the emotion, etc. Okay, yeah, I like the idea that they can attend to form more when retelling. I found that's definitely that's what somebody's that's what Lise has just written in the chat. Um, I find that's definitely the case. And some of my um, my sort of revelations, I think, from today about the importance of retelling are also that they come from my own experience of learning other languages because I myself have benefited from retelling. And I know that if I tell a story, um, a second time, then I, I tell it much better and I can challenge myself to actually thinking about the language that I'm using. Okay, so my take on retelling, and then we're going to get to some concrete classroom specifics. Now, this is straying from TBL because I've said what's special about retelling for me is that firstly, and most importantly, it allows for extended terms, even for low level learners. Now, I haven't read um, anything about this in, in the TBL literature, um, but this for me is one of the huge bonuses. Um, and it, it basically, if you have a story that students have connected with, and they have understood it, they've done all the comprehension, they've retold it, um, they, they, they tell it the first time just concentrating on the content, and then they tell it again. You're giving them loads of opportunities to speak in English, um, and it's very motivating, <laughs> um, which is linked to my second point. I found is inherently mo motivating, and I think it's partly because you can hear yourself speaking at length about in your in your um, second language and this is backed up by a, a little piece of research that I read by Caroline Stoikovi um, who also found that her learners just loved retelling okay um, she wasn't talking about TBL but she said that her learners just loved it um, I find that retelling as an incredibly flexible task due to the variables that we're going to come on to a little bit later and I love this logic of it. It moves from the content, the what, 
to the how. Okay, I love that about it. It makes sense and it chimes with how I like to learn languages. Okay, um, and we'll look at we'll look at this a bit later as well, properly. But when I say how, I'm talking about Lexis, grammar, discourse, or even genre-based issues such as how you set a context when you tell a story, or even how you empathize with the audience. So you could be retelling not to focus on these, um, these um, system-based things, yeah, but you could be retelling a story for a second time and thinking, okay, this time I'm really gonna try and empathize with my audience, put myself in their shoes, explain the bits that will need explaining better, et cetera. Okay. OK, so what's the procedure in the ELT classroom? OK, so this is what you do. Um, first of all, you'd have your initial text. This could be an audio text, a visual or a video clip. OK, it could be a text in your course book if it's a story like um, text. OK, and you do what you'd normally do with it. You have your pre-reading, your during reading, your follow up activities which would aid involvement and for comprehension purposes. Okay, so the normal first stage, okay. Then they retell, okay. So this could involve retelling in a pair, retelling it in a small group, okay. The focus here is on content, okay. So the students are retelling the story, but they're getting the main ideas across. They're not thinking, they're not worrying too much about what the actual words that they're using or the grammar that they're using. They're just retelling the story. Okay, and this, this retelling, I've put a little watch here, um, could take place at the in the same lesson, but maybe at the end of the lesson, there's been a little break from the first encounter with the text. It could be at the end of the first lesson. And then we go on to the retelling two, which might take place the next lesson that you see them. Maybe at the beginning, it could be a kind of warmer, but with a little bit of a form focus. It could be in the same lesson as well. If you've got a longer lesson, I don't know how long your lessons are. You re they refocus on the content this time. Um, sorry, they refocus on the content again. Um, and then before the second retelling, they also zoom in on aspects of form, which you as a teacher have probably, but not necessarily selected, okay? For some learners, especially the more you redo this task, the learners themselves can choose the focus. So typically you might say, okay, I want you to pick out seven collocations that you like, okay? Or I want you to, 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 um, to look at, um, all the examples of the past continuous use with the past simple, okay, for example, okay, or to look at the discourse markers. I want you to look at the temporal markers of first, then, and after, all those kind of words, okay. And having thought about that and worked on it, maybe they circle, underline, do a little activity that you've pre planned, then they retell to their partners, ideally a different partner. Um, but not necessarily, okay? Um, and then maybe again, the next lesson <laughs> or even the next week, sometimes I like to have a bit of a break, you could get them to retell it again if you want with a different focus or you could go back to the content focus or whatever. It could be just a warmer and you just do it for the sake of getting them um, getting them back into English at the beginning of the lesson. Okay, so that's your procedure. I'm going to show you um, a story now, which is one of the Sensations news articles on video. And I want you just to listen and watch the story. And I want you to try and make sense of that headline and image there. Yemeni fishermen find fortune inside whale what on earth do you think that means okay you don't need to write anything but i'm going to show you the video now i hope you enjoy it
The discovery of a dead whale has changed the lives of some Yemeni fishermen. Recently, Abdul Hakim and his fishermen friends set sail with their nets as normal. They came across a dead sperm whale floating in the sea. I head out to sea every day in search of my daily catch. And on one of those days, we found a dead whale. It turned out to be a whale full of ambergris. Ambergris is a solid substance which forms in the digestive system of the whale. It is used in the perfume industry to make quality scents. When the fishermen pulled the whale's body to the shore and opened it up, they discovered a 12 kilogram lump of ambergris. This was later purchased by a businessman from the UAE for the sum of $1.5 million. For these men, who live in a country which has been experiencing a terrible civil war, this is a fortune. The discovery has allowed them to spend money on important purchases. It has made their lives easier. Many people made a good use of it. There are those who bought boats, others built or fixed their houses. I built my house. I built my future. The circumstances here are already difficult. Life has definitely improved for these fishermen. However, they'll carry on going out to sea because fishing is their passion. We are simple people, fishermen looking for our catch every day. If you found your catch for the day, you thank God. Suddenly, the Most Merciful gave us this. Okay, um, I hope you enjoyed that story. Um, I've used that lots of times with my students and, and they all really enjoy it. Um, that was actually a B1 plus, so intermediate level, um, but I've used um, the lower levels and also the higher levels, which you can on sensations, which is really, um, really good. Um, okay, I hope you enjoyed that story and obviously, in class, you could do it in exactly the way we discussed in terms of the comprehension and then retelling the content and then retelling after a focus, um, retelling with a, a focus on vocabulary or lexis or what, vocabulary, sorry, or grammar or whatever. Just a little word of warning. Um, you do need to think about which stories are appropriate. So some of the um, lovely stories, even on this sensation site, they're not all appropriate. And um, because some of them might be too fact oriented, for example, they might be just come across as more of a string of more fragmented facts. You have to choose a story with a strong narrative thread. Um, so uh, to give you some examples, this smiley face, yeah, choose the right level. Obviously that's helped if you choose sensations because it has different levels already. Um, choose the, uh, a, uh, a text which has a good shape. So typically a beginning, middle, end kind of shape that we expect um, when we encounter a proper narrative or story. Also to choose a story that isn't too long or too short. I mentioned earlier, you don't want a story that students can memorize because that defeats the object. Um, these stories are all the right length, but any new stories would be the same on other um, forums, okay? And I find that um, in tune with what we said earlier about stories, it, if it, st students are much more likely to be empathetic if there's a key character or group of characters in this case, or an animal that they can actually um, engage with. Okay, I've, I've put a whale image here. I'm not sure if you don't engage with the dead whale, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so just a reminder from Aristotle, the first essential, the life and soul, so to speak, of a story is the plot. A story that is whole, has a beginning, middle and end. Okay, so bear that in mind when you're selecting your stories. 
otherwise it, it probably won't work as a retelling task and it might finish very quickly. Um, okay, a little task here. Um, <laughs> this is a silent task. Now, I want you to get your phone or to get a mirror. I know this is slightly odd, um, but I'd like you to have a go. And I want you to imagine that you're retelling that story that we just heard about the whale and the fisherman from Yemen. Okay, I want you to think about who, where, what, what, what and how and the end. Okay, so I'm going to give you, you um, I'm just going to give you a few seconds to think about that. Use those question words to help you. I hope you were paying attention to the um, to the video. <laughs> Not you can have a slurp of tea. And when you're ready, no one can hear you. I'd like you to actually speak to your phone or speak to the reflection in the screen or a mirror and just retell that story quickly about the Yemeni fisherman. I'm going to give you two minutes from now, okay? Off you go. Okay, you might be in the middle of the story, you might have finished it. I'm going to carry on here. Now, in a classroom, I wouldn't handle that in the same way because in a classroom, you'd have spent much longer with the original text. Um, you'd have fully comprehended it. You might have made notes or do whatever you do in the classroom to actually try and internalize the story, okay? So that was a hard ask, but I, I wanted you to try and remember um, this session. And I thought that might be one way to get it um, deep into your brain. Okay, now let's look at the actual classroom. Okay, what I do when I'm getting students to retell is I give them a bit of support or scaffolding. Okay, so um, what I've found is that some frames, you, you, you can't simply have one frame for all stories, although beginning, middle and end is quite a good one that works um, generically. You have to adjust the levels of scaffolding. So um, these are some of the frames that I use, okay? You might just say, I want you to think about the lead up, the problem, if there's a problem, it obviously depends on your text, and the solution. This is the one that works most often, beginning, middle, and end. It might be a story which has a lead up, a conflict and a resolution, which is obviously similar to the problem and solution one, or it might just be a main event, a cause and effect. So it helps you as a teacher to think about these frames, and then you might be able to guide students before the retelling, um, the content retelling stage using one of these frames. Okay, so for example, with, with, that, um, with that whale, the Yemeni fisherman story, this is what I gave to my learners in a recent class um, at both um, upper intermediate B2 and also my advanced class C1 slash C2, okay? Um, so this is the core, the beginning and the middle and the end. They just had to ask those questions. But to make it more real, almost sort of like a whole speech act, I also gave them this little beginning bit. Did you hear that story about blah, blah, blah? Which is what we'd say if we were telling somebody the story. Naturally, I mean, in our first language. And then at the end of that, we also have very naturally, let's imagine, let's say you're going for a walk and you tell, you tell somebody about the story about the whale. And then you wouldn't just, you wouldn't just stop at the end. You'd say something like, oh, amazing, hey? Yeah, have you ever heard of ambergris? Or something like that. I, that. That story really stuck with me. So you'd either have a brief personal reflection or a final comment or a question or an exclamation, 
Okay, so I think it's very useful to to give a sort of genre perspective and to help even advanced learners by doing these mini sandwich <laughs> parts, if you like, the yellow and the orange around the blue. Okay, so you can do you can work with any of the frames that I suggested to do it like this. Okay. And of course, you can use prompts as well to help them when they're retelling. Sometimes I use picture prompts like these. Okay, if you've got a video, you can just um, screenshot them. But obviously, to save time and to add variety, you can just use word prompts as well. Okay, so they've retold for content. And then you get them to focus on language, specific language like these. I'll just let you read these example areas that you could zoom in on. Okay, these are, there are multiple areas. These are just examples of anything you could do in your classes um, that would be relevant to your learners. And if necessary, you could show them that frame again um, when they get to retell for a second time, okay? When I say focus on specific language, obviously this would involve a little stage in your lessons um, where you would get students to get out their highlighter or do a little gap fill exercise or circle something, um, or whatever. Okay, so you have your little focus, your language focus stage, and then you move on. Okay. Now, this, I thought I'd put this one in because it, I had a quandary when I was, um, when I was looking at retelling, I thought, well, how authentic is it? Because I wanted to be authentic. So we've talked about how, how authentic stories are and about how, how authentic retelling is that we do it all the time in our first language. But is it authentic in a classroom? because learners are often retelling the same people, the same story. And unless you, um, you're like my, my grandmother who you know, used to tell the same story to me again and again and again, it's actually not a very natural thing. Um, but obviously one solution to that is to change your interaction patterns. So get them to retell the story to a different person or to have a different text that they start with so that they're telling different stories, okay? But to counter that, just that reminder that learners are motivated in my experience by retelling. There seems to be a kind of inherent challenge, a game-like element to it. It's confidence boosting, um, possibly because they, again, what we mentioned earlier about the longer turns. And you can make it varied by changing the performance conditions which we're gonna look um, at now. And in addition, it can be very learner centered because especially with high level learners, they can focus on what they want to. OK, ways to differentiate. OK, this is one thing I love about retelling. OK. Obviously, if you're using sensations, they have different level texts, so you can differentiate that way. But you can also um, give more or less planning time. OK, do you let them take notes before they retell? Do you give them visual or verbal prompts? Do you even let them prepare at home? Who are they performing their retelling to? Is it um, to one people or to two? Is it to a friend or somebody they don't know very well? Is it interactive? Is your listener going to be, to be responding? Oh, really? Or asking questions? Or is it just a monologue? Do they get chance to rehearse their retelling? Do they say it to themselves in their head? Do they do it to a partner or do they do it to a group before the actual retell? How familiar are they with the original story? How much time did you send at the beginning on the comprehension? Yeah, I've got um, some advanced learners who don't actually necessarily have to spend long with the original story. Um, they can go pretty swiftly onto the retelling, but obviously that depends on your learners and your focus. Okay, um, do you give the focus that learners are focused on at the retelling or do they choose 
themselves okay do you give them agency that's what I do especially with my high level learners I say okay what would you like to focus on today I think this text is interesting because of boom 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 or sometimes I just leave it entirely up to them and they select okay um okie dokie and when they actually retell what do they retell with do they retell with the images or do they retell with the frames that we mentioned okay how much support those are all ways they're, they're some of them are performance conditions but some of it's about um, preparation ways that you can make it more or less challenging uh scary exciting for them and time pressure was the last one time pressure how much time do you give them to actually retell do you say you've only got a minute or do you say you've got three and a half minutes My learners seem to enjoy retelling as a memory test to hear themselves talk in English. This goes back to what I said about this really long term. They enjoy it because they can convert some of the lexis or grammar they witnessed into output so as to extend their interlanguage. So I can see some of them doing that. Yeah, I can see them trying to use the new words and the new grammar and that sense of pride at the end. And sometimes they have it for their own stated or unstated linguistic goals. For example, I spoke to one learner recently and asked her what she had been focusing on during the retail, retail two. And she said she was really focusing on her clear pronunciation. Okay. I'll just let you read that. I asked one of my students, an advanced learner, why she liked retelling because she often she often asked me um, to have another retelling exercise and this is what she said I think the second point, it was easy to remember this text because the story was easy. I think that again goes back to your story selection. I think when she says easy, I think this is because it had a beginning, a middle and an end. So I think that's why it's so important. Um, but I also appreciate her last quote that she clearly liked a mini um, form focus because then she was able to actually force herself to use those new items on the retail too. Okay, other things to think about. I find that it helps, I've put here adult learners, but actually I've also found it useful with, with um, teenagers. If you make your rationale explicit. So tell them why you're doing retelling um, because otherwise they might just think it's a bit sane. Okay, they might just think, well, where's the challenge? We've already done this. If you say we're doing this because and give some of the reasons, it can really up the ante. OK, it can it can motivate them where you can give feedback. Obviously, it's much easier in a smaller class, um, but, you know, it, it is important to to monitor as they're talking and to give feedback, even if just it's, if it's whole class general feedback and do give learners opportunity to exercise agency. So sometimes let them choose the texts let them decide on the performance conditions how much time do they want to prepare do they want the prompts the um, visual aids to help do they want the frames and give them the option at least of the language focus you could even if you just give them two choices okay and this this chimes with um the cefr when it talks about the individual as a social agent i think putting that focus on the learner is important as well Okay, to sum up, <laughs> I've done this very um, fleetingly, I know, but this is what I've hoped to have done or hoped to have shown. Stories have an in a visible scientific impact on the brain. Language and memory are inextricably connected. Most learners are engaged when telling retelling stories. And I just want to, to give a little bit of evidence for this. Um, I was reading an article by Hawkes, who said that um, that his his they were younger learners. His teenage students 
um, really enjoyed redoing the task. His wasn't specifically actually about retelling stories, but his was on redoing a task. And he said that 60% um, or more of his students actually said that they liked doing the retelling um, and the rest of them were often indifferent. It wasn't that they disliked it. So I think that's important to bear in mind. And those are teenagers. So um, just as a general thing, learners often prioritize speaking. And as I've mentioned, this is my particular favorite, stories provide ideal substantial material because they allow for longer terms. If you contrast that with something like, for example, what do you think of X when some students might say very little. Task-based learning, which was, is what has influenced this, this session and on retelling is meaning focused and interactive. And it often, not always, includes task repetition and retelling. Different iterations, to use Diane Larson Freeman's word, can have different focal areas to enhance linguistic development. Retelling allows us to play with that cognitive load. Remember the piano metaphor. It can be easily adjusted for variety, memorability and differentiation. Think of that mind map image that we looked at briefly. Retelling can cater for and promote learner agency and individuality. Oh, and I thought I'd finished with my dog. <laughs> okay, any questions or comments? We've got three minutes, but I'm happy to go on a couple of minutes longer. Hi, Fran. Thanks Hi. ever so much. Um, uh, thank now we've had... Um, just one question so far in the Q&A box. Um, so if anyone else has got any questions they'd like to ask, please do. But our first question is from Abdul Haq Walizada Bahin. And um, uh, they say storytelling is great, but how can we adopt it in low level class? If there is any specific strategy for that, please help. Oh, well, I would say even with adults that visuals are a huge aid um you know so use lots of visuals and lots of sort of pre-reading so prediction from the heading um even you can even give a little brief summary yourself in very simple level english and then get them to read if you teach children um um abdul then you could um use a story that they're already familiar with um a fairy tale for example um, because then they already are familiar with the content. Um, I hope that's helped. <laughs> Great, thanks. And um, maybe if you're, you can type if you have any follow up in the chat there. Um, uh, Laura asks, um, she says, Great presentation, thank you. Something that appeared is jigsaw um, retelling. Can you explain? So, what yeah, that is, thank please? you very much for asking when when there's a term that you don't know. Um, so jigsaw retelling would be where you where you have um, students with different texts. So maybe you have um, text one and text two. You can have more, if you, but it's actually more faffy. It's more difficult the more you have. Let's say you have two different texts and half the class read text A one story let's say it's about the whales and another story read and a different another and the other half sorry the other half of the class read a completely different story okay it might be on the same theme it might be on finding treasure but it might be a very different story yeah and then they get together and then that creates an information gap so it really um does motivate students to retell the story because their partner won't know what their story is about OK, that's obviously a bit more tricky to manage because then even at the first stage when they're dealing with their text, you've got half the class doing one text and half the class doing another. So it's a bit more tricky to manage, but it can be worked through. Thank you. And um, Michelle asks, I've also noticed that learners prioritise speaking. Why do you think that that it? Why do you think that is? And how can we help them understand the importance of listening as well? Why do you think that is? I think because it is, you know, primarily all about communication and meaning. Um, you know, we can probably manage without reading or to a better extent in the world. Um, but we can't manage without speaking, um, speaking and listening. 
we arguably could without um, reading or writing much. Um, so I think it's all about need, really. But I agree with you that, of course, speaking and listening are, you know, completely integrated and without one, you can't have the other. So um, I think one of the ways to do that, well, you can actually just be explicit and say, tell them that, but also in your activities, for example, if you're doing retelling, um, you could also have lots of lessons where you get students to listen and respond um, to the storyteller. So they're responding, oh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, 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 why? Why did that happen? You know, those sorts of um, responses or little back channeling devices, even if it's just, oh, oh, oh no, oh gosh, that sort of response. Um, so then you're showing that you're listening as well. Yeah, but you can't really separate the two. So I completely agree. Students reading their own stories, absolutely. Yeah, love personalized stories. Um, yeah, I'm a, a big user of personalization in the classroom and personalized stories, anecdotes are fantastic. Um, yeah. There's one question in the chat um, from Mohammed. Um, what could be some general questions for retelling? Some so, general questions. So it, on the first retelling, your basic questions would be, you know, um, what happened to X, whoever X is, you know, what happened to the Yemeni fishermen? Um, and um, so first of all, what was their situation before it happened? Yeah, what was their situation at the beginning? What was the big event? What happened in the middle? Yeah, and how did they respond? You know, those are your basic beginning, middle, end sort of questions. Yeah, or you can use as we, as I showed you, all those little post-its, the WH questions for the beginning, middle and end. Yeah. Great. I hope you. that's been helpful um, and you've learned something new. I hope, I hope it wasn't something that you already knew everything about. You've learned something new or it's reminded you of something that you used to use or whatever. Good luck with it. And remember that um, this kind of area as well is a, is a very rich and fertile field for action research. So if you want to do any projects, you've got any in-house in projects at school where you want to um, serve your own development, then a bit of action research on this topic um, would be ideal. Well, Fran, it's totally a coincidence that you mentioned that because um, the next webinar next month that we're going to be doing is looking at supported experiments and action research and how to apply them in your classroom. So oh, okay. look out for the everybody look out for the um, uh, announcements and sign up for that um, in the coming weeks. Um, thanks ever so much, Fran, for all of your support and help uh, that you've given everybody today. Um, I'd just like to finish by reminding everyone about the um, great resources on Sensations English and um, you can access those um, uh, by and, and access the teacher's edition by following the link that I've just popped into the chat there for people now. Um, uh, there's also the Sensations English webinars um, as I mentioned earlier and um, we've got as I mentioned just now, we've got another one coming up next month and they're going to be monthly as well as some special series that we put on later in the year as well. If you haven't already, then please check out the other Sensations with webinars and I've put those links in the chat for you now as well. Um, and um, finally, just to say, please do start using um, uh, these authentic graded global resources um, uh, and really up-to-date content and always at five levels so you can use them from A2 all the way through to C1 and above. Um, Fran, once again, thank you very much That's for okay. today. Um, we, I really thank you. Um, it's been a great experience and um, thank you everyone for coming and um, sharing your afternoon with us. Thank you. Happy experimenting. Bye.